1931, Japan invaded Manchuria and the rest of China followed in 1937. The Chinese Air Force was in a parlous state and they needed a capable commander. They got one in the form of an American. But before the main story, a quick word from my sponsors. The team over at Wartime T-Shirts and myself have partnered up to offer you 10% off any order with the code A Few Minutes of History. There is a T-Shirt for nearly every period of military history out there. And when you buy a T-Shirt, Wartime T-Shirts will send one to a veteran in need. Use the promo code A Few Minutes of History at checkout to receive 10% off your order now. The link and more information will be in the video's description and the comment section. Now, back to the video. Claire Lee Chenault, a retired US Army Air Force major, had gone to work in China in 1937 as an aviation advisor to Chiang Kai-shek, the Chinese national leader. He then became director of the Chinese Air Force Training School. Chiang Kai sent him to America to ask for aircraft and pilots. A deal was done to supply China with 100 Curtis P-40 Tomahawks. 100 pilots were recruited from the US Army, Navy and the Marine Corps. Only 99 sailed for China, however, because one, Albert Balmer, was refused a passport due to his participation in the Spanish Civil War. Joining them were around 200 ground crew. They were discharged from the US military and employed by a private contractor, Camco, the Chinese Aircraft Manufacturing Company, as instructors. In reality, they were essentially mercenaries, which, ironically, was why Balmer was refused a passport. Arriving in China on the 24th of September 1941, they were officially called the American Volunteer Group, but were to become officially known as the Flying Tigers, whilst their aircraft were known for their shark-faced nose art, which was copied from RAF Tomahawks in North Africa, who in turn had copied it from German planes in Crete. Chenault had studied Japanese tactics and the Soviet performances in border clashes with Japan in 1939. He also looked at his own planes and pilots, especially their deficiencies, and worked out the best way to combat experienced Japanese pilots flying superior aircraft using the training he himself had received as a pursuit pilot. The Flying Tigers had a huge advantage over the Japanese. There was a network of observation stations all over China, equipped with radios or telephones, and as soon as Japanese planes were spotted, the Flying Tigers were able to get to the area in time to gain altitude, which gave them the advantage, negating the inferior maneuverability of their planes whilst utilising the higher dive speed of a P-40. His tactic was essentially dive and zoom, rather than getting involved in dogfighting. However, before they got into combat, the pilots needed training from scratch, as many had never flown fighters, let alone pursuit trained. Training consisted of learning to attack bombers, with the RAF supplying Bristol Blenheims as targets. For fighter combat, they used each other. In the early days of their training, a number of accidents occurred, resulting in destroying planes and dead pilots. One day became known in the group as Circus Day, due to the number of accidents that occurred. After a number of planes were damaged due to bad landings, Chenault called a halt to training. As the ground crews were dispersing the planes around the airfield, one crewman gave the plane too much throttle when he braked, and the plane stood up on its nose. Other aircraft were taxied into each other, and one mechanic crashed his bicycle into a plane whilst watching the carnage unfold. One pilot, Edwin Connett, had a number of accidents in succession, and it was joked that if he carried on, he'd become a Japanese ace. The Flying Tigers were divided into a headquarters squadron and three combat squadrons. The first squadron were called Adam and Eve, the second, the Panda Bears, and the third, Hell's Angels. Once most of the planes and pilots were ready at the end of 1941, they were getting ready to fly from Burma to Kuming in China, with all the spares, ground crew, etc. following in on trucks. Events at the start of December 1941 changed the plans, however. The Japanese then smashed the US Air Forces in the Philippines and they hit the British in Singapore and Malaya, and one of the greatest concerns to the Flying Tigers, they targeted Thailand and Burma. China was utterly dependent on the Burma Road for supplies that came in from the Burmese port of Rangoon, and this road, as poor as it was, had to be kept open. If the Japanese captured it, China would most likely fall. Three days after Pearl Harbor, Thailand surrendered, and the Japanese prepared to attack Burma. Chenault sent the 3rd Squadron, Hell's Angels, to support 6-7 Squadron of the RAF who flew Brewster Buffaloes from Mingdalong near Rangoon and the other two squadrons to Kuming. The first mission was a reconnaissance flight. A P-40 was modified to take aerial photographs, borrowed from the RAF. Photos were then taken of the build-up of Japanese material in Bangkok in Thailand. On the 20th of December, they got their first combat action. Thanks to the early warning stations, Chenault found out that a Japanese bomber force was heading for his base at Kuming. 
He sent his second squadron, the Panda Bears, to where they expected the Japanese to arrive, and the first squadron, Adam and Eve, to the west. The first encounter was disappointing for Chenault and his Tigers. The Japanese spotted the fighters and dropped their bombs and headed for home. The Panda Bears hesitated, unsure whether the bombers were friend or foe. The Adam and Eve spotted their bombers and got overexcited. They forgot their discipline and made wild individual attacks. They said later they were lucky they didn't shoot each other down or crash. As poorly as they executed their attack, they were still reasonably successful. Out of a force of 10 Japanese planes, three were shot down, with some damaged ones crashing further on. Chenault in his debrief reiterated the need for discipline. At Mingdalon, the Hell's Angels squadron parked at opposite ends of the airfield to 6-7 squadron, and despite repeated requests from Chenault, the RAF would not cooperate with them. They didn't share intelligence and wouldn't listen to the Flying Tigers' frequencies or share their own. The Tigers used to watch the dust created by the buffaloes taking off. This was how they encountered the first bombing raid on Rangoon. The RAF failed to see the Japanese, and the Tigers attacked only after the bombs had fallen. Despite not being able to stop the raid, for the loss of two planes, they shot down six. On Christmas Day 1941, the Japanese launched a huge force to destroy Rangoon. The Flying Tigers got above them and put their dive and zoom tactic into practice. They shot down 15 bombers and nine fighters for the loss of two planes, the pilots surviving to fight again. The RAF put 16 planes up, shot down seven enemy, but lost nine planes, with only three of their pilots surviving. After this action, Hell's Angels only had 11 operational planes, so the Panda Bears were sent in to relieve them. After this, the RAF cooperated, sharing rations and frequencies. A ship's bell was set up to be rung so that both forces could react together. The Japanese attacks continued on Rangoon, and the increasingly worn-out P-40s faced bombers that often had three escorts each. Despite being outnumbered, the RAF and the Flying Tigers kept defending Rangoon against the Japanese. Their actions were usually more successful than not, but the losses kept mounting. However, their actions did keep the Japanese from knocking out the docks at Rangoon, allowing a steady trickle of supplies to reach China. Bombing raids ceased for two weeks in January 1942, until the Japanese managed to replace their lost planes. The added bonus of this was it took their planes away from the intended invasion of India and slowed the advance into Burma. Back in Kuming, the pilots were bored and 11 resigned. However, on the 24th of January 1942, the 1st Squadron were ordered to Rangoon to relieve the 2nd Squadron. The Tigers continued to battle the Japanese for the next month, but sorties became continuously reduced as planes became unavailable due to a lack of spares, batteries that couldn't hold charge, bold tyres exploding on landing. The mechanics worked wonders to keep them airborne. In February, Pan Am Airlines landed five flying boats in Calcutta, India, with the first shipment of supplies. The planes were able to be repaired and then continue the fight. At the end of February 1942, the Japanese were 20 miles away from Rangoon, and the RAF and the Flying Tigers evacuated. Second and third squadrons in Kuming lost five aircraft after getting lost escorting Chiang Kai-shek's DC-2, which provided the navigation. They crash-landed in a cemetery 200 miles from Kuming, and it took them nearly a week to walk back. Two of the aircraft were subsequently repaired and the others cannibalised for spares. At Magui in Burma, the first squadron had to be evacuated as well. Facilities were non-existent, including early warnings. And the Japanese, instead of sending mass fighter escort bomber formations, sent reconnaissance planes to see where the Tigers were on the ground. So, Chenault changed his tactics accordingly. He had the squadron send up small patrols to attack the advanced Japanese bases and try to stop their build-up. The 3rd Squadron, Hell's Angels, then relieved the 1st Squadron, and Adam and Eve, who had been on action constantly for nearly three months. On the 21st of March 1942, in retaliation for a strafing raid, the Japanese launched 226 sorties over 26 hours against the Tigers' base at Magui. Four aircraft were left, which Chenault ordered to the Camco facility at Low Wing, and their ground crew followed in convoy. The RAF also moved their six remaining planes to China as well. Chenault set up a warning system between the Burmese border and Low Wing, and they also got some replacement aircraft in the form of newer models of the P-40. These had heavier wing armaments and better Allison engines. Politics now came into play. Lieutenant General Joseph Stilwell commanded the American forces in Burma and wanted to use the Flying Tigers as reconnaissance forces and as an extension of his own artillery. The Tigers' employer, Chiang Kai-shek, wanted them to fly ground attack missions. The pilots, although trained as interceptors, flew these missions, but they weren't happy and Chenault had to put down a mutiny. 
His relationship with Stilwell was fractured, as Stilwell thought the pilots, who were technically civilians, should obey him. In April 1942, Chenault allowed himself to be recalled into the army as a colonel. He was promoted to Brigadier General the next week. His nemesis, Clayton Bissell, from his days at the Army Air Corps Flying School, was Stilwell's air commander. He was promoted to Brigadier General the day before Chenault, and he didn't agree with Chenault's tactics and the use of warning systems. The US Army Air Force thought it could absorb the Flying Tigers into its own organisation, but the pilots, who were ex-Navy or Marines, wanted to go back to their old services rather than into the Army. Another obstacle was that the planes were owned by China, who also paid the men's salaries. Biswell went to the Tigers' base at Lowing and threatened the men, both pilots and the ground crew, that if they didn't sign up for the Army Air Force, once back in the States, they would be drafted in as privates in the infantry. Chenault, however, had powerful friends, namely Franklin Roosevelt, the US President. He arranged a compromise. The Flying Tigers would be part of the Air Force if he could command the tactical air forces in China. He knew that he would more likely to convince the mutineers to stay if he was in command. The Doolittle raid on the 18th of April 1942 caused more friction. Chenault wasn't informed of the raid, and Clayton Bissell didn't think he needed to know. Chenault was furious. He believed his warning and recovery system could have helped the Chinese avoid retaliation from these occupied coastal areas. The Japanese pushed inland immediately to take out any airfields that could be used to attack the home islands, and on their way, they tortured and murdered thousands of Chinese civilians. To his dying day, Chenault believed that those casualties were avoidable if he would have been involved in the planning of the raid. On the 1st of May, the Tigers abandoned Low Wing, destroying supplies and planes that couldn't be recovered, and the Japanese conquered Burma and were in a position to turn west into India or east into China. This became a real problem. Burma's fall meant that supplies to China was virtually non-existent. The fall of China would mean that India and Australia would be completely under threat. This would also mean Allied resources would have to be diverted from other theatres to stop Japan. There was one obstacle to the Japanese advance, the Salween River. The only route was through a deep gorge with one bridge. The British destroyed that bridge, but the Japanese brought up pontoons and their engineers worked furiously to construct a bridge. Once across, nothing would have stopped them. Their only problem was, until the bridge was built, their forces were stuck in a column almost 20 miles long with nowhere to take cover. So, on the 7th of May, the Flying Tigers launched an attack. They destroyed the partially built bridge and brought down rock walls of the gorge, trapping the Japanese between a rock and a very wet place. For four days, Chenault sent every airworthy plane within flying distance against the column, which was ultimately decimated. It stopped the Japanese invasion, but it still left the Japanese in enough control of Burma for two years. The Japanese put planes in Burma, in the China, and built airfields in the Chinese territory they had captured after the Doolittle raid. Chenault then used the Tigers in a fire brigade role in response. They would land at last light on the makeshift airstrip close to their target, refuel, grab a couple of hours sleep on the ground or in their cockpit, then take off, attack and return to the main base. One of these raids was on Hanoi on the May the 12th, 1942. Six of the Flying Tigers flew to a former Chinese training airfield, 100 miles inside Japanese territory and the same distance their target, the airfield at Giolam. They attacked at dusk, catching the Japanese completely by surprise. A Japanese transport plane containing high-ranking staff officers who were due at a conference was the first thing hit, exploding in flames. A further 10 planes were destroyed, with another 15 estimated to be damaged, and the runway was severely cratered for the loss of one P-40 and its pilot. These hit-and-run raids convinced the Japanese that the Flying Tigers were a much larger force than they were. The Japanese, after the war, admitted they thought Chenault had hundreds of planes, not a few dozen. On the 4th of July 1942, the American volunteer group, the Flying Tigers, became a component, part of the US Army Air Force, assimilated into the 23rd Fighter Group. In return, China was promised extra military assistance and material. And despite Clayton Bissell's earlier threats, most of the men who'd come from other services went back to them rather than joining the army. Some went to work in the aircraft industry, and Chenault only managed to convince a few to stay with the 23rd. He managed to convince a few more to stay a few more weeks to train new second lieutenants straight out of flying school. On the 4th of July 1942, the Flying Tigers flew their last mission. Four planes attacked an airfield near Hengyang, and they faced 12 Japanese planes at odds of 3 to 1, which were low for the Tigers. They shot down six of them for no losses. Chenault then took command of the China Air Task Force, whilst many of his pilots continued to have success in various theatres of the war, many earning medals 
including two who received the Medal of Honor. Chenault remained commander of the China Air Task Force until the 10th of May 1943, when he took command of the 14th Air Force. It was the smallest American Air Force of the war, but, as with the Tigers, Chenault achieved results out of all proportion. When President Roosevelt died, Chenault lost his political top cover, and his enemies in the War Department forced him to accept retirement. The numbers of Japanese planes destroyed by the Flying Tigers varied. Chenault reckons they got 299, with another 153 probables for the loss of 12 P-40s in combat and 66 destroyed on the ground, which includes the 22 they abandoned when retreating from Low Wing. In the darkest days of the Far East campaign, where the Japanese conquered everywhere they went, the Flying Tigers were one of the few success stories. They had invaluable assistance from the British during the Rangoon campaign, but none of it would have been possible without the hundreds of Chinese workers and people who built makeshift airfields by hand and operated the early warning systems, a great danger to themselves because of Japanese reprisals. As a footnote, the modern 23rd fighter group, flying A-10 Warhogs, kept the memory of the American volunteer group who they absorbed alive. Their planes have shark's teeth painted on their noses and they have the code FT for flying tigers on their tail. The legacy of the tigers lives on. That concludes today's video. Hope you all enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share if possible. Thank you all for watching. Don't forget to also head over to Wartime T-Shirts where you can get 10% off your order with the code A Few Minutes of History. Thank you all for watching. We'll be back very soon. Cheery bye.